Folks, it is good to be back with you in this Lenten series and talking about the cross of Jesus. Just uh, We talked last week about how difficult it would be to speak from a cross. When you're hung on the cross, that you would have to pull yourself up. I mean, it would take great effort, great pain and great effort, and you would know that, to pull yourself up by the spikes that are going through your wrist to even be able to speak out loud. But Jesus didn't do it just once or twice. He did it seven times for us, and he spoke out loud for us so that we would overhear him all down through the ages. And today we're kind of on the second one of those statements that he made. I'm excited about the message I have to share with you. Would you pray with me as we go into this time of God's word together? Lord, I just thank you so much for this day and for this time. I I thank you for uh, the series that we're in where we can really concentrate on your cross. Every time we walk into this building, it's here in front of us at the front of the church. Uh, That's the symbol of of the faith that we have, this Christian faith as, as followers of your son, Jesus. Uh, but help us to learn more and more about it and what it should mean to our lives. I think we're going to do that today. Uh, But just bless this time we have in your word. Uh, We pray this and we trust this in Jesus' name. Amen. I want you to know as we begin today that I I love all the Gospels. And of course, I'm a pastor, I would say that, right? Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, we all know the Gospels. But each one of those Gospels is something special. It's written maybe from a different perspective or to a different audience or whatever. And one of the reasons, and we're in the Gospel of Luke today, just so you know. Luke was a physician. Uh, He wrote with a physician's heart, a heart of caring. And one of the reasons I love the Gospel of Luke is because of this. His Gospel, folks, highlights Jesus' concern for the meek and lowly of our world, for those who are less fortunate, for those who are the nobodies of the world. I can say it that way. But this is what Jesus was concerned about. And I don't know if you've ever thought about this or not, but but consider these things about the Gospel of Luke. The Gospel begins by highlighting Jesus' lowly position in society. Do you remember the birth story? Luke chapter 2 is what we read from almost every single Christmas Eve, and we read the Christmas story. That's where the full one is, is in Luke chapter 2. But here he's uh, born into a lowly position, born in a stable with a feeding trough for a crib. That's what a manger was, a feeding trough for a crib. In Luke's description of Jesus' ministry, we also find that Jesus consistently was concerned for the sinner, those who had not yet connected with God, the outcast, the unclean, what society would consider, again, I think I said it before, a nobody. That's who Jesus was concerned about. In the Gospel of Luke also, Jesus clearly defines his mission in this way, as someone who has come to seek out and to save the lost. I mean, he gives us his mission statement in our scripture, you know, uh, and and so that's what he was all about. So it shouldn't surprise us that it's only in Luke's gospel that we have this conversation that we're going to look at today, a conversation between Jesus and the two thieves. Other Gospels record it differently, but Luke is the only one where we have this uh, particular conversation. And so um, as we consider this conversation today, we're going to take a look at Jesus' words here and discover what we can learn from them and what it is about them that's going to help us walk closer to him too. So let me share the scripture from Luke 23 with you. I'm going to read one verse to get us started, uh, uh, 32, and then jump to 39. You can follow along with me here on the screen. So here it is from Luke 23. Two others, both criminals, were let out to be executed with him, meaning Jesus. And then we pick up in verse 39. One of the criminals hanging beside Jesus scoffed, So you're the Messiah, are you? Prove it by saving yourself and us too while you're at it. I don't know about you, but I don't get this attitude. The guy's hanging there on the cross, about ready to die. You know, he's going through the same thing Jesus is, and this is his attitude, but this is how he reacted. But, but it says in verse 40, the other criminal protested, don't you fear God even when you have been sentenced to die? We deserve to die for our crimes, but this man hasn't done anything wrong. And then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus replied. Here's our words for the day. I assure you, today you will be with me in paradise. And at this time, we're going to hear from one who was there. Gene, you're on. But we're going to hear from one who was there. Please give Gene your attention. (laughs) 
It had been a long time since I had felt anyone's compassion. My mother died when I was seven. My father was a drunkard whose idea of encouragement was to call me an idiot and to tell me to leave him alone. So I did. I began committing petty crimes when I was 10. I'd committed armed robbery when I was 15. And I killed a man before I was 20. I was a hopeless cause. And here I was, 47 years old, carrying my cross on the way to Calvary. It was amusing to me that Jesus of Nazareth was being crucified with us. I knew of him. Some among my friends had gone to hear him. Jesus had even eaten with them. I knew some of the girls who had found religion by listening to him. They claimed he was God's Messiah. Strange Messiah, befriending sins and prostitutes. If I believed in God, that's the kind of Messiah I would want. But I didn't. And so I was sure he wasn't. Yet I can tell you this, I could not take my eyes off of him. A huge crowd came out for his crucifixion, the money changers, the religious leaders, the Romans, and all those religious hypocrites. They stood around him, hurling insults at him. I joined in at first, glad that they weren't insulting me, but even I didn't have the stomach for it. It was then I heard him praying from his cross, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. I was stunned. This friend of sinners prayed for mercy for his enemies. He turned and looked at me as if he could see right through me, and once more he looked at me with compassion. Even in my pain, I found myself drawn to this man. If, as some said, he was sent from God, and if God was like this man, showing mercy to sinners, then perhaps... It was mercy for me. Levi, my partner in crime, began to hurl insults at Jesus once more. I shouted, Levi, stop it. Don't you see? We're getting what we deserve. He's done nothing wrong. Then, for reasons I still don't understand, I turned to Jesus and said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. He replied, Truly I tell you today, you will be with me in paradise. Thank you, Gene. So folks, what does this scene, what does this scene, what does this short scripture teach us about Jesus, the one who went to the cross for us? What does it teach us also about ourselves and and how we need to be living as followers of Christ? So I I just want to get right into it. Again, you got that little outline there in your bulletin. You can kind of follow along. If you're a fill-in-the-blank person, you can do that. But the first thing I want to talk about is this, this reality. Folks, Jesus associated with sinners, didn't he, during his life? That's what he did. That was his MO, so to speak. That was how he operated but he associated with sinners. You know, it's been said that a person is, is known by the company they keep. A person is known by the company they keep. Have you guys heard that before? Maybe your mother told you that at one time or something. I don't know, or a version of that. But uh, in both life and in death, Jesus was one who probably didn't do the norm. He associated with sinners. And, and I want to tell you this, Jesus' association with these sinners, with you know known people, uh, uh, thieves or whatever, you know, in his life, um, really drove the religious elite crazy. It just drove them absolutely nuts. Let me give you a couple of examples, okay? The first is from Luke chapter, going back to the gospel of Luke, um, chapter 15, beginning with the first verse, and it says this, tax collectors and other notorious sinners. Folks, isn't that something? Because he had a tax collector that he called to be one of his disciples. Matthew, I believe, was called to be one of his disciples. He saw one of the chief tax collectors at the end of his life, a guy by the name of Zacchaeus. I'll talk about him in just a second. Jesus hung out with, isn't it interesting that they have their own category? 
They weren't lumped in with the other notorious sinners. They had a category all their own. This is how bad they were and how much people hated them and how they refused to do things, how much they refused to do things God's way. But it says, tax collectors and other notorious sinners often came to listen to Jesus teach. That tells me something about Jesus, doesn't it? If, if this part of society wanted to come hear Jesus teach, that said something. They were welcome. This made the Pharisees and teachers of religious law complain that he, Jesus, was associating with such sinful people, even eating with them. I'll get back to that in a sec, too. But let me give you a couple other examples. I think you guys will probably remember these. I'm not going to look them up or read them to you or whatever, but Jesus allowing the prostitute to uh, wash his feet with her tears. Do you remember that story in Scripture? Or calling garden variety sinners to be his disciples. Or this one, he touched lepers, those who were unclean. Jesus would touch them and heal them. And, and, and you know, uh, ministry is messy sometimes, you know, and Jesus knew that and he wasn't afraid to mix it up with folks. And then, of course, I mentioned this before, at the end of his ministry, just before he goes to Jerusalem, he's on his way uh, to Jerusalem from up in Galilee. He goes through the little town of Jericho. And, you know, with Jesus, there was always like a parade following him, right? His disciples and everybody else following him. He was the master and they were the disciples. And uh, so it was as they went through Jericho, and as they were going through Jericho, he looks up in a big sycamore tree, which there's one in Jericho today, right in the city square there. But he looks up and sees this short little guy up in the tree. You guys remember the story? I think he was called a wee little man. His name was Zacchaeus. And what did Jesus say? Zacchaeus, you come down. He said, I want to eat at your house today. Whoa! I want to eat at your house In the Middle East, folks, if you chose to go and eat with somebody or share a meal or break bread with them, this was huge. This was huge. And what you were saying was, is this person is my friend. You talk about driving the religious elite crazy. They didn't know what to do with this. Jesus is going to go and eat in the home of Zacchaeus, a known degenerate. I mean, we know this guy. We know what he's all about. He's in that category all his own of tax collector, you know. And uh, these are people we don't associate with, but Jesus did. And guess what made it even worse? Jesus gets to Zacchaeus' house. Zacchaeus throws a luncheon party or dinner party or whatever. And guess who he invites besides Jesus? Well, who would you invite? People you know, right? Your friends. And so he invited his friends. Guess who Zacchaeus' friends were? They weren't the religious elite. They were kind of the lowlife, the, 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 the nobodies, the, the, the riffraff of the day. That, that's, that's who Zacchaeus, I mean, that's what the religious people would have called him. And, and, uh, uh, but that's who, that's who he ate with. So here's Jesus eating in Zacchaeus' house, probably with prostitutes and tax collectors. And I'm guessing thieves, probably thieves too. I don't think that was the first time Jesus experienced thieves when he was on the cross. I think he'd experienced that before in his life, and and they knew him, and and he knew them, and and, and so forth. And we'll get to those two thieves here in a little bit, but I can just picture Jesus sitting at Zacchaeus' table and laughing. Have you ever pictured Jesus laughing? I have a laughing Jesus picture in my office somewhere. I don't have it up on the wall right now, but I always love that picture because this is like real Jesus, right? Right? In human form, he's chuckling about something, but I can see him there laughing and telling stories about the kingdom of God in such a way that those around him, whoever they are, they want to hear more about this. They want to hear more about this. And then I picture the religious elite outside. Folks, mobs gathering at a place to protest is not something new. Sometimes we look at that in our day and go, this this is different, you know, we've never... They were doing that back in Jesus' day. And I'm sure the religious elite were gathered outside of Zacchaeus' home to let everybody know how terrible this was, what Jesus was doing. And I can see Jesus sitting at the table, seeing them outside, and then getting up from the table and walking to the door or a window, whatever, so he could speak to them. As they're asking, you know, why does he eat with people like that? I think Jesus' response would have been something like this. You just don't get it, do you? They're out there waving their fingers at him, you know? Anybody else's mom ever do that to you when they're trying to make a point? You know, that's what they were doing to Jesus that day. They were waving their finger. And Jesus would say to them, you just don't get it. 
And then what he did was this. He gave them his personal mission statement. He wanted to tell those religious leaders why God had sent him, why he was here. And so he tells them this. This is from Luke 19.9. You can follow along with me, I think, here. It says, salvation has come to this home today. He's talking about Zacchaeus now, right? This is bold. This is really something. For this man has shown himself to be a true son of Abraham. And folks, here it comes. Wait for it. Wait for it. Here it comes. All right? He says in verse 10, For the Son of Man came to seek and save those who are lost. Jesus just spilled the beans, didn't he? This is why I'm here. This is what my life is all about. I have come to seek and to save those who are lost. And so just as Jesus lived, so did he die. So did he die. Even as he was being crucified, Jesus was carrying out this mission statement. He did not die alone, did he? He had company that day. He had company. And his companions at Golgotha or Calvary, whatever you want to call the place of crucifixion, it was with two known criminals. That's who he hung there with. Folks, do you see how important, are you getting a glimpse of how important reaching lost people was and is to Jesus? All it is is those who haven't yet heard the good news. And we have good news to share. So if we live it and we believe it and we're followers of his, we need to let other people know about him too. And what peace and what joy, and I'll talk about that in a little bit here too. But it was so important for Jesus to reach lost people. It's the very thing that drove him to the cross. Love for those that the rest of the world wouldn't love. This is what drove him to the cross. And folks, if this is what mattered to Jesus, if this is what mattered to him reaching people who were lost, what does that mean for us as his followers today? I know what you're thinking. You're already guessing and you're doing good, right? If Jesus wasn't afraid to associate with criminals and prostitutes and people who are considered unclean, what about us? Jesus expects us to follow in his footsteps in every way. Now, let me make this personal just for a second, if I can get real personal, but let me ask you this question. Do people in your life who do not know Jesus, they are not Christians yet, do they feel comfortable around you? Isn't that a great question? Do people who do not know Jesus, who aren't a part of our club, I'm saying that tongue-in-cheek here today, but aren't a part of the church, aren't a part of followers of Christ yet, do they feel comfortable around you? You know, when you're done with a conversation, do they feel small? Or do they feel valued and accepted after a conversation? Are you willing to associate with people others might consider riffraff? That is not a theological term, by the way. I think everybody understands what I'm talking about when I say that. You get the idea. But reaching those who are lost was the driving mission of Jesus all the way to the cross. And I believe today he wants us to know that that is his driving mission for us too. Here's a couple other things briefly, all right? Just briefly about these final words that I want to share with you today. And the first is this that I noticed in these last words. There were two criminals that were on either side of Jesus, and there were two very different responses, weren't there? to what Jesus, remember last week we talked about uh, Jesus' first words, Father, forgive them. They had two very different reactions to Jesus' little prayer there, didn't they? You ever been to a family event and you start to tell a story? And, and this is a memory, this is something, so family gathering, maybe reunion, whatever, you start to tell a story, and here's what happened to uncle so-and-so, you know, and you start to tell this story, and one of your siblings walks up and says, that's not the way it happened. Anybody ever been there besides me? We all have our versions of what was happening, right? There was two very different versions here on this day of the same event. And so l l let me go through these with you. You know, Jesus had prayed the Father forgive them, Luke 23, 34, but they responded different. H here was the difference. The one man's heart was hard. It, it was hard. The one thief on the cross, even as he hung on the cross himself, naked and dying, humiliated, he attempted to validate himself by joining in with the crowd as they insulted Jesus, trying his best to make Jesus feel small. You know why? So that it would make him feel bigger somehow. The guy's hanging on a cross for Pete's sake. I have no idea how he came up with this. 
but he's joining in. It's a bully's way is what it is, and maybe that's what he'd been all his life. I don't know. But he looked at Jesus, and he saw a failed Messiah. Father, forgive them. Is this because you couldn't do what you're supposed to do? I think he was looking for a military Messiah like many were at that time, not what God had in mind. Why aren't you fighting the nasty Romans? Why aren't you getting us down from here? And so he had nothing but contempt for Jesus, and his prayer made him mad. But something happened to that other thief. Something happened to that other thief in his heart. As he watched and he listened to Jesus on the cross, at some point, the light went on. A little light bulb over his head, right? The light went on. He got it. He got it. And he stopped hurling insults at Jesus. If you remember in different uh, Gospels, it records this event, and both thieves were hurling insults at Jesus. But this one stopped. This one stopped. Something hit him about Jesus. And he turned to his other friend on the other cross, and he rebuked him. Maybe realizing he'd be dead in a few hours, he needed to find hope. And he saw something in Jesus at this point. He saw something in him worth following. And he said to him, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Folks, in this old world that we live in, I want you to know there's still those of both persuasions. There's still those who tell both sides of that story. There are some who look at Jesus and consider him a failure. And there are others who look at Jesus and all they see is hope. The question we must ask ourselves today is this, which thief will I be? Which thief will I choose to be? And folks, this brings me to the final thing I want to say about these last words of Jesus, and I'm going to wrap it up with a little bit of an outline. I think you've got three blanks maybe under that number three on that sheet you've got there. But if you look at this last statement of Jesus with me, um, it is a simple but significant statement. Two S's, simple and significant, but I want you to understand that. This may seem simple, but it's incredibly significant because there's, there's three things Jesus talks about here that are incredibly relevant to any day, including today. Here's what he talks about. He talks about life after death. Who doesn't want to know what comes next? Anybody? You know, I mean, everybody's curious about that, right? John 14, you know, and other, other places too. But, but he talks about that. He talks about God's mercy. He gives us some clues into God's mercy. That's huge. We all want to know we have mercy. And then also, he talks about heaven. So here's how I'm going to do it, the three Ps, all right? The first one is the peace of Jesus' words. Here's the peace of Jesus' words when he says today, today. Folks, over 30 plus years of study and I've studied this scripture, and this particular scripture has had an incredible effect on how I see life after death. I just want you to know that. This scripture right here has a lot to do with how I see and how I view what happens to us when we die. Though I believe there will be some changes later, uh, there's a place called heaven or paradise that exists when? Today. Today. So heaven, folks, basically is this. Can I give you my definition of heaven for the day? It's where Jesus is. That's heaven. It's where Jesus is. And what did Jesus say? Today. Today. Incredible words of peace. So if we were to die today or something were to happen to us, if we too give our lives over to Jesus like that second thief did, he will promise us as well we will be in paradise with him today. Today. It brings incredible peace. If that doesn't bring you peace, I don't know what does. I don't know what does. Here's the second thing, the point of Jesus' words. Let me go through this real quick. But the point of Jesus' words, he says, you will be with me. This is the main point he was trying to get across to this thief. And this was to demonstrate the great mercy that God shows us. God's mercy is for everyone, friend, even you hanging on the cross beside me. If you're simply willing to submit and give your life to me, I'll take care of you. That's what Jesus is really saying here. So Luke, whose focus throughout the gospel is on Jesus' concern for the nobodies of this world, wants us to know that even a criminal of his day is offered salvation. God's gift of mercy is for everybody. And finally, we have the promise. That's the last P, the promise of Jesus' words. When he says, in paradise, in paradise. The Greek word for paradise is a, a transliteration of a Persian word. Do you know where Persia is? Modern-day Iran, 
that, those are Persians. They're not Arabs. They're Persians. Uh, but this is where it comes from. It's a Persian word that refers to the king's garden. That's what the paradise word means, the king's garden. So as a theologian, practical theologian, as a pastor, it, it, it looks like in Genesis we began in the garden. And then what happens at the end? We return to the garden, don't we? We begin in a garden and we return to the garden, the one that Jesus restored on the cross. Folks, these final words of Jesus point us toward his mission. And the truth is, it's our mission too, to seek and to save the lost. Why is Trinity here? This is why we're here. And this is, includes those who may seem hopelessly lost. But I want you to know something before I quit today, and that is this. No one is beyond God's grace. No one that you can think of today, even that would come to mind, is beyond God's grace. If they'll simply pray as the thief on the cross did, remember me, Jesus, and he will. Would you pray with me? Gracious God, thank you so much for this day. Thank you for um, your word to us today and, and, and for your incredible mercy and grace uh, that comes to us through Jesus on the cross. He promised us this, this, this. These gifts are ours now because of what he did, and we just give you thanks, Lord God. As the song says, Jesus paid it all. We didn't have to. He paid it all, that we might have eternal life with you beginning today and then in the life to come as well. Thank you for this time. Bless it to our lives, to your glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.